Well, I want to welcome everyone to this uh, lecture, and it's our first Chancellor's Lecture of the 2012-2013 Chancellor's Lecture Series. And what better thing to do than to kick it off with one of our own brilliant members of our Vanderbilt community, Dr. Dan Roden. Uh, Dan is Assistant Vice Chancellor for Personalized Medicine, the William Stokes Chair in Experimental Therapeutics, uh, and he's had a tremendous impact on Vanderbilt and literally on the world as our initiatives in these important areas continue. Um, the pace of change in this field has been just dramatic. And so when I say over the last 10 years he has accomplished these things, these are major milestones in an area that is moving very quickly. He helped develop our initiative in the broader area of pharma, pharmacogenomics discovery and implementation. He worked, worked tirelessly on the important Vanderbilt DNA data bank, uh, our uh, uh, kind of cutting edge BioView program, and he uh, is also a leader in the John A. Oates, John, it's great to see you, Institute for Experimental Therapeutics. Uh, he was recently elected by the American Heart Association as a distinguished scientist, widely recognized across all the areas of clinical care, genetic, cellular, and molecular bases of arrhythmia, and he's a true leader in his field. Um, I called over, I spoke to someone in my office, I said, I know Dan pretty well, but can you kind of get me his resume so I can learn a little bit more about him? And, and they said, well, here's some of the resume, and I said, well, where's the rest of it? And they said, it's 98 pages. <laughs> I mean, if I, to, for me to get 98 pages, I'd have to attach part of a phone book. Uh, I think he's the best of what Vanderbilt has, this commitment of bench to bedside, this focus on research and discovery and education, and then making an impact in the world. Uh, I think that uh, we're gonna learn a lot of interesting things tonight. Uh, there's been so much in the news about personalized medicine, genetics, tailoring care to the individual. Uh, and as most things that appear in the media, some of it's true, some of it's wishful thinking, and some of it is not true. So what Dan is really gonna be able to do for us is to kind of tell us what is the state of play in this important area? And what were the developments that got us to this point? And where is this important area of research and discovery and education and for humanity care going? So uh, with no further delay, let me uh, ask Dan to come, on, come up here and let's welcome Dan Roden. So I have to I have to get all my microphone stuff on and thank you very much for the introduction and uh, I was telling the Chancellor earlier that I'm going to have trouble saying the Chancellor over and over again I was having I was telling Nick earlier that um, I have no problem giving a big plenary talk any meeting you want I have no problem in going to you know uh, that place in Boston or that place in Palo Alto and giving a talk. Um, but there's something very special and very stress-inducing about giving a talk to your home institution. So I hope I, I don't uh, excessively disappoint. Um, and uh, yeah, let's see how we're gonna start this. So it, it uh, well, that's not a good sign. <laughs> Oh, I see. I, I see exactly what happened here. Hmm. Let's start with that one. Start at the beginning instead of starting at the end. That's 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 how it works better. So uh, this was the title that I was. Uh, I'd love to say I was assigned, but actually I made it up myself. So I have only myself to blame uh, for this. Um, Nick did not mention that I came here from Canada. Uh, 30 plus years ago for a two-year fellowship uh, and I'd like to say that I'm still working on that and <laughs> the great Canadian physician uh, Sir William Osler who uh, started uh, his career at McGill, my alma mater, 
then moved to Johns Hopkins where he created the Johns Hopkins School and then uh, moved to Oxford where he uh, uh, was the Regius Professor of Medicine, he wrote the textbook in internal medicine, Oster's textbook of medicine, full of aphorisms and this is one, the good physician treats the disease, the great physician treats the patient who has the disease. So the idea that we personalize care, the idea that we treat people as individuals as opposed to people who just happen to have a disease has been there for a long time. What's different now is all this hype and hope uh, exemplified by Time and Newsweek covers and, and the focus has been on genetics. The, the first draft of the human genome, which I'll come back to a little later, was uh, unveiled at the White House in the year 2000, published in 2002, 2003, and uh, that has led to great hope that we'll be able to care for patients better, we'll be able to prevent disease better, we'll be able to develop new drugs. And so uh, that's the hope. And the hope extends across the use of drugs. So personalizing therapies is also part of this hope, using genetics to custom tailor therapy, to get personal as a drug company would do. And, and I, I like this quote here. The Mayo Clinic, at the time this came out in the Wall Street Journal, was planning a database of every patient's history, including their genetic makeup. And we'll come back to that. Uh, we're, we're being taped, and it'll be on the web, so I don't want to say too many nasty things about my friends at the Mayo, but <laughs> I'll just leave it at that for a while. So this is the roadmap for the, for the next uh, 40 minutes, I'm told. Uh, a little bit about why people vary in drug response. Not so much why, but the fact that they do. A little bit about modern genetics. And again, because <coughs> I was asked to do this at home, I was uncertain whether this audience was going to be 90% geneticists and 10% uh, civilians, so to speak, or 90% <laughs> civilians and 10% geneticists. So, so I have to apologize to somebody because I'm making it too simple, and I have to apologize to the rest of you for making it too complicated. But I think it's important to say some things about genetics and its history, and then a little bit about genetic variation and what that means in terms of how we take care of patients and what is that starting to mean. And then some programs that we've put in place at Vanderbilt. I'm a spokesman for a big team of people, and I'll acknowledge that team now and again at the end uh, that have put us on the international map as leaders in implementation science, and that's not an exaggeration. So how do we decide as physicians that a drug works for a particular patient? So in, in the year 2012, we rely heavily on what's called the randomized clinical trial. We will take a group of people who have a disease, and we will divide them in two and we'll randomly assign half of the group to treatment A and half of the group to treatment B. Treatment A is our drug, and treatment B could be a different dose of the same drug. A different drug could be placebo, could be nothing. And then we count noses. We count how many people uh, have a good effect, a cure. We count how many people have no effect. We count how many people have a side effect. And we count how many people have a really bad side effect. Now, we'll come back to the really bad side effects in a little while. And then we add it all up and we say, well, which treatment is better? So if you're looking for the cure, A is better than B. If you're looking for no side effects, A still looks better than B. But if you're looking to avoid the serious side effects, B looks better than A. So the real world gets a little fuzzy when you try to figure out which treatment is better than which other treatment. And, and that extends not just to cure yes or no, but to things like lowering blood pressure or lowering cholesterol. There are many, many of you in the audience, like me, take medicines for those things. And here is an example of about 100 patients, no, actually it's more than 100, but two or 300 patients given uh, a, a very common lipid-lowering drug, simvastatin. I'll come back to simvastatin in a little while. And uh, for six weeks, they're given this dose. And then the question is, how, how much did it lower the cholesterol? And simvastatin does exactly what it's supposed to do. It lowers the cholesterol 40%. That's a huge decrease. And it's associated with all the good things that you would associate that with, decreased heart attack, for example. But some people don't have much of an effect. And so whenever you look at drug actions like this, you always see that most people are average. That's why we use the word average. And, and, and that's a gratifying effect. But there will always be some people out here and there's some people out here, so the questions we ask are, why is that? So the question is not whether a drug works or not, but whether a drug, whether this particular patient is going to have 
one of these responses. And wouldn't it be nice to know whether this person was destined to have this response or this response? When I came to Vanderbilt, I came as a fellow in the Division of Clinical Pharmacology. And it took me 10 years to explain to my mother what it is clinical pharmacologists do. <laughs> but this is what we do. We study mechanisms underlying variability in response to drugs. And uh, we're celebrating our 50th anniversary uh, next year. So we hope, uh, we hope that's going to be a big deal. And uh, since you uh, called John out, I'll call John out as well and just say that it was John Oates who started the division in 1963. Um, so some of the reasons that we look at variability in response are listed here, age, sex, ancestry, drug interactions are a big thing, things in our environment, diet, exercise, other things that we don't understand very well. Um, whether you get the diagnosis right, whether all these people, if they all had hypertension or they all had heart attacks, do they all have the same kind of high blood pressure? Do they all have the same kind of cancer? Do they all have the same kind of ulcer disease? Or are there subsets that respond better than others? So we're using genetics to improve diagnosis. And then genetics in terms of how we respond to drugs, and I've put down two reasons, but there are many, many reasons, and an army of people have spent careers looking at the influence of genetics on drug response. So a little bit about genetics, and I'll start with the idea that we're all a little different from each other, and we're all familiar with that because we all have different fingerprints. You see that on, on CSI or whatever. Uh, and uh, you may not know that, uh, and you probably don't know, that the idea that each one of us has different fingerprints was originally described by a famous Czech physiologist. The other thing that Nick didn't say is that I grew up in Canada, but my parents came from from Czechoslovakia uh, after the Second World War. So um, Perkinji, who's, of course, nobody in, in Prague would pronounce his name that way. His name is Purkinje. So Perkinji described uh, fingerprints. He also described certain kinds of cells in the brain and in the heart that uh, uh, neuroscientists and cardiologists are obsessed by. And again, he comes from this little country in Central Europe, which we now call the Czech Republic just north of Prague. And the other contribution of the Czech Republic to modern genetics, remember, is uh, the, the monk Mendel, who was, did his experiments with pea pollination in, uh, in uh, near Brno. Actually, I don't know why these stars are where they are, but, but he was actually near Brno. And he was, his idea was that he would cross pea plants, and he could see that peas would transmit characteristics from one generation to the next whether the pea was crinkly or smooth, for example. And his great con contribution was to develop a rules. He did it hundreds, no, thousands of times, literally, and could develop rules about the chances that two crinkly peas would produce a smooth pea were this, and the chances that they would produce a crinkly pea was that. And the, the rules that he gave us for inheritance you know, stand to this day for human diseases as well. So the next big deal in genetics were, were these two guys, uh, Francis Crick and James Watson, who were two young structural biologists. They were not uh, molecular biologists. They weren't geneticists. I guess uh, they were just structural biologists. And they were interested in this very large molecule that seemed somehow connected to, to transmission of genetic information called deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA. And they were in a race with other people to try to understand the structure of DNA. And in 1953, using x-ray crystallography, they solved the structure and uh, published a paper in a journal called Nature. And this is the paper, the whole paper. <laughs> 900 words in April 1953. So there are two, two phrases that I'd like to show. One is uh, the, the first sentence, we wish to suggest a structure for DNA. The structure has novel features which are of considerable biological interest. That's understatement. <laughs> and then toward the end, the, second, the, the, the last sentence actually of the, of the entire manuscript, the rest of this is acknowledgment, including um, uh, Rosalind Franklin, who's, who's here, who many people think should have won the Nobel Prize with them. Um, but uh, the last sentence of the actual manuscript is this, and it says, it has not escaped our notice that the specific pairing we have postulated immediately suggests a copying mechanism for the genetic material. So that is also a fantastic understatement. What they meant was, here's the structure. And they have, a, they have the, the double helix with which we're all familiar here. And it's like a ladder twisted on itself. So everybody, when they look at the structure, they get obsessed by the double helix and the, and the outside of the ladder, but just like this picture here. But what's really interesting are actually the little rungs 
that connect the ladders to each other. And what Watson and Crick saw is that the structure looks like this. So these are abbreviations for specific chemicals. And C and G always go with each other, and T and A always go with each other. And these little dots represent what we call hydrogen bonds. So those are bonds that hold the whole thing together, but they're weak bonds, so they can come apart. And so they realized that every time you have a C over here, you have a G over here. Every time you have a G, you have a C. So they're paired like that. And they said, oh, look, the problem is that you have a mother cell, it does something, and then the daughter, it divides into two daughter cells. And how do the daughter cells know to be the same as the mother cell? How does information get transmitted from the mother cell to the two daughter cells? And, and the reason was immediately obvious when they saw the structure, because they said, look, if those are hydrogen bonds, they can unfold. And if they unfold, then each side can be a template to create a copy. So just before every cell divides, they go, it goes through this process where it replicates itself. And that's how information is transmitted across cells, across generations, in peas and in humans. The way we display, G so DNA actually doesn't exist as a long, long, long molecule unfolded. It's, it's relatively compact in the nucleus, more compact at some times in the cell cycle than others. And we each get uh, genes from mom and dad. So this is the normal complement of a normal female human. Uh, 22 pairs of chromosomes, so that's 44 altogether, plus an X chromosome and a Y chromosome, that's what makes her a female. So, sorry, male. <laughs> I was just, that was, a, that was a test. I knew, I knew that. Um, so, so, I told you, you come, you come to your own home institution and it's high, it's high stress. <laughs> So this is, the way, this is the way we display human chromosomes, and this is the way they look in the nucleus of a human cell, particularly just before, well, just before it divides, it looks a little bit different from this, but that's, that's the way it looks. And this is a, a cartoon of how it looks. The chromosomes are numbered from one to 22. It's a complicated system. One is the longest, 22 is the shortest. And, and then there's an X and a Y, so that makes this a female. <laughs> a male, just, just testing. Um, so, so uh, this shorthand also has a couple of things on it. So, for example, chromosome 12, just to take one in the middle, has 132 million base pairs. That means chromosome 12 is one long strand of DNA that is 132 million of those D C Cs, Ts, Gs, and As. And that has some regions of that 132 million encode for genes. Uh, and, and some re say, uh, are genes, and some regions are between genes. And how the genes make proteins is, uh, is a lifetime uh, worth of work and, uh, and uh, something you'll have to take on faith today. But there are 1,370 or so genes on chromosome 12. Each one of them makes a protein or more than one protein. So proteins are things that tell the body how to work. Proteins are things that transmit signals. Proteins are things that make uh, muscles stiff. Proteins are things that make the heart beat. Proteins are things that make us think. So proteins are the workhorses. Genes are just this long code that tell the body what kinds of proteins to make. And importantly, where to make them, what cells to make them in, when to make them, how much to make. And you've heard a lot over the last week or two about so-called junk DNA, the region of DNA that doesn't have genes, uh, that doesn't encode for genes. It turns out that a lot of that junk DNA is not so junky. It turns out its job in life is to do all that regulation. And that's a process that's going to be difficult to understand but really challenging. So the total is, for a genome, is, all the, is the sum total of this. So it's 3 billion base pairs, 25,000 or so genes, and around 200,000 proteins, give or take. Um, and uh, so I want to switch gears and talk a little bit about genetic variation. And I'll start by showing the, a picture of these three people. When I'm not doing geneticist, gene, genetics or personalized medicine, I'm, uh, I take care of patients who have abnormal heart rhythms. And uh, there's a large group of us, and uh, three of them are shown here. And you can, you can look at them and see that they're different in some way. Uh, you will look at them and, and see differences um, that I can see as well. But, but I will tell you that there are other things that make them different. I will tell you that two of these people are from Chicago. I won't tell you which. Uh, uh, and you wouldn't know it when you talk to them. Uh, two of them, not the same two, uh, trained at Duke. And when you talk to them, you'd know that part. <laughs> 
One of them trained at the University of Rochester, but they're all here and they're all good friends and good colleagues. So, so the question is, what makes them look different? What makes them behave different? Now, the behavior part is hard, but the looking part is, uh, part of that is, is genetics. A lot of that is genetics. So across these three billion base pairs, we're now getting a much better handle on how much variability there is between individuals. Uh, and it turns out that of those three billion base pairs, there are gonna be 10 to 20 to 30 million that are different. And that's enough difference to make Kathy Murray look different from John Lee to look different from Wally Clare. The commonest kind of variant is what we call a SNP, a single nucleotide polymorphism. All that means is one of these letters has changed, its partner has changed as well, of course. And so in this code somewhere, there was, was, was a, a, C, a GC pair, and now there's a TA pair. And that's called a, a single nucleotide polymorphism. We, 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 when we talk about them, we don't say SNPs because it's much faster to say SNP. So um, there are 10 to 20 to 30 million SNPs across the human genome, and we're still counting. But uh, the common ones we know about, the rare ones we're still discovering. So what do genetic variants like SNPs and other kinds of variants actually do to human physiology and disease? Well, most of them we just don't know. They do something, we think, because that's why Wally and John and Kathy look different, um, but uh, we don't really have a handle on that. Sometimes there's some rare variants that can cause a rare disease. And uh, here are some examples. This is an x-ray of a child or a teenager with cystic fibrosis. This is an electron micrograph of blood cells that have sickled, so this is sickle cell disease. These are diseases which you get because you get an abnormal gene from mom and an abnormal gene from dad. Those are, we call those recessive. This is an example of a gene where one copy of one gene is abnormal and it causes the disease. You can see this is three generations, grandfather, father, and two children. All of them have really long arms, really, really long fingers. They're very skinny. Their wingspans are much bigger than their height. And they have a disease called Marfan syndrome that makes them look like this, but it also gives them a tendency to have ruptured aortic, aortas and uh, they can die from that. And then this is a mammogram uh, that is normal. And this is a mammogram that harbors breast cancer. Now, breast cancer does have a genetic component, but there are families in which there's a very high incidence of breast and ovarian cancer. And in those families, there are rare SNPs or rare variants that can drive the development of cancer. So a single genetic variant in one copy of the gene can make somebody highly susceptible to early breast cancer. And that's something that uh, we're beginning to think people might want to know about. So other things that genetic variants can do, they can predispose to a common condition. So this is where I have to get a little bit technical with the genetics to try to explain to you this experiment that, that we've been doing in our, in our field for about the last seven years. It seems like the last 70, but it's, it's, all, it's quite recent. So here's the idea. Instead of focusing on a family that has Marfan syndrome or many members with breast cancer, we focus on a huge population, thousands of people. And it turns out for this experiment, 1,000 is a lot, 10,000 is better, and 100,000 is even better. So you focus on this very large population, and you assign each one of them a phenotype. That, what that means is you say, this person has the disease, this person doesn't have the disease. This person has the disease, this person doesn't have the disease. So the ones in orange have whatever disease I'm studying. And then the technology is now available to take each one of those people and ask what their genetics are at a particular SNP that we already know about. And you can do that at, at a million different SNPs. So you do it, each one of those 10,000 people is tested at a million different sites. So you can understand why we need big computers to manage these data sets, because they get very large very quickly. And suppose at one of these million data sites, one of these SNP sites, you found uh, this kind of segregation. You found that people with variant A, people with the G, say, did not have the disease very often, and people with the T had the disease a lot. So that would, you could do a statistical test and you can attach a p-value to that. So p is a probability value. The lower the value, the more likely it is that the, that, the, that the finding is a true finding. So we have now a million different statistical tests. We have to have a way of displaying them. And it turns out there's a very clever way of displaying them, and that's this. This is what's called, well, I'll, t I'll tell you what it is in a second, but basically each one of these dots is one of those p-values for one of those million tests. The p-values are mostly 10 to the minus 2 or 10 to the minus 4, so not very low. But here's one that's 10 to the minus 23. 
So that's a really, really low p-value. That means for whatever it is this person was studying, I happen to know what this is, but I'm not going to tell you because it's not really very important for the, for what it's pretty. Uh, uh, well, somebody asked me afterwards, I can tell you what it is. But but this is a very, very low p-value. So that's a real finding. Um, and that's where the 10 to the minus 10th would be right there. So the 10 to the minus 23 is really, really low. So there have been 1,200 studies so far looking, using this technology, which is expensive and highly revealing, to identify new genes involved in a variety of different diseases. So when you read that uh, gene X causes diabetes or gene Y causes prostate cancer, you're usually reading about a study like this. So there's no question that when you look at this particular plot, I told you I was going to tell you what it's called. It's called a Manhattan plot. This is the brownstones, and then every so often there's a little skyscraper, and that's why it's called a Manhattan plot. So one of the first applications of this kind of technology was to a disease called age-related macular degeneration. The problem in age-related macular degeneration is that people have a problem with the retina, the part of the eye that, that actually absorbs light and makes you see, and it's in the central part of the retina. So when they look at something, they see a big blob. The peripheral vision is fine. And Jonathan Haynes, uh, one of our senior geneticists here, is one of the drivers of this particular experiment across thousands of people, not just at Vanderbilt, but around the country and around the world. And there is no question that there is a signal here, for example, at a gene called complement H. We had no idea that complement H was involved in, in vision at all before this study. Now we know, and people are developing tests, people are even thinking about new drugs, simply because of this genome-wide association. If you have a variant, it doesn't mean you're going to get the disease. The, the, the chances of you getting the disease based on these variants is actually pretty small. So that's one of the things that people complain about when they read these studies, because they say, well, you know, it doesn't tell me yes or no. Well, welcome to the genetics world. Nothing, nothing in genetics says yes or no. They always say maybe this or maybe that. That's what genetics is all about. But this one really confers increased risk. Another phenotype that we've spent a lot of time studying at Vanderbilt is a phenotype called atrial fibrillation, a common abnormal heart rhythm, uh, commoner with age, but it turns out there's a huge genetic component. And if you just do that experiment and take patients with atrial fibrillation and patients without, you again get uh, a very, very strong signal here with a p-value of 10 to the minus 70th, which is like an un unbelievably low number. Uh, nobody would have thought that this gene was involved in atrial fibrillation until this study was done. Now, it turns out that if you have one copy of this SNP here, your chances of getting atrial fibrillation over a lifetime are increased about 30 percent. And if you have two copies, <clears throat> like I do, your chances are increased 70 percent. So I'm not doomed to get atrial fibrillation, but I will tell you that the other part that's important in all this is family history. And, and <clears throat> this is my mother's electrocardiogram. So, so uh, I may get atrial fibrillation, but uh, I'm hoping that I won't. And I'm doing things, I think, that'll prevent that. So uh, those are things that, that, uh, that, how genetics relates to disease. Here's how genetics relates to unusual drug responses. And I want to say, give you three vignettes about that. So I, we talked a little bit about serious adverse drug effects. And, and the, the next slide, I hope, doesn't, uh, doesn't nauseate people too much. These are some examples of really spectacularly awful drug effects that can occur really, really rarely. Um, and they each have names. So if you're given an ACE inhibitor, a common blood pressure lowering medicine, there's a small, small chance that you'll get severe edema of the tongue and the throat. And, uh, and that can be life threatening and it can actually be fatal. Uh, it happens very rarely. Uh, so at any given time in the hospital, there's very few people, in fact, zero people with this, usually zero people. Drugs can create abnormal heart rhythms. That's my obsession. Any drug can cause a really serious skin rash. Many anticoagulants can cause bleeding within the brain. That can be fatal. This is uh, statins, drugs that are used to lower cholesterol, can cause muscle problems. Uh, and there can be blood problems with certain anti-malarial drugs. So, so each doctor will see one of these once or twice in a career. Um, unless you're Dan Roden and you see a lot of these, or unless you're Nancy Brown and you're focused on, you're obsessed. Nancy's as obsessed by this as I am by this. Um, and Nancy's in the audience somewhere. Uh, right there. I have to say all that because she's one of my bosses now. <laughs> anyway, um, so, so, so you sort of say, well, it's one of those you know, accidents. 
And I wish I knew what happened, but I don't have time to work on it. And it's not going to happen again in my career as a physician. But the problem is that if you add up mortality from serious adverse drug effects across the country, there's something like five or 600 people who die every day. And that's the same as having two jumbo jets run into each other on a runway and kill everybody on board every single day. Now, you think that would make news. If it happens like this, it, does, it makes news. But um, uh, it's thought to be the fourth to sixth leading cause of death in hospital in the United States. So it's a real problem. And because it's so unpredictable, we'd love to know whether there's a genetic component that we could use to predict that. Um, for some of them, this is myositis with statins, again. Um, people have done genome-wide associations and found things with low p-values. And this is a particular variant where if you have the TT variant, so two copies of T, that's 77 percent of this audience, your chances of getting a, a, a muscle problem with simvastatin is really small. But if you have the CC, your chances are increased about 20-fold, up to 20 percent over five years. So that's something we think people might be interested in knowing about. And I'll tell you about how we're doing, uh, letting people know about that. This is a, a picture of what I call the commonest cause of morbidity and mortality in the United States uh, uh, right now. And that's a, a picture of a clot in a coronary artery. This picture, unfortunately, was obtained at autopsy. But if you uh, develop a clot in your coronary artery, the usual symptom is to get chest pain. You come to the emergency room, you're whisked off to the catheterization laboratory, an angiogram is taken. This is a picture of the arteries in the heart. And it's pretty clear that there's a blockage right there. The artery just trims down to almost nothing. And after a stent is put in, the artery looks pretty normal. And after your stent is put in, you're given Plavix, 75 milligrams a day. And the reason you're given Plavix is because we don't want that clot to reappear uh, inside your stent. And one of the reasons, one of the studies that supports giving Plavix is a study called TIMI-28 uh, that was reported in 2005. That becomes important in a second because what TIMI-28 did is it did what I told you we do. We randomized people to placebo or Plavix. Clopidogrel is the real name for it. And then we add up how many people have an endpoint after a month of treatment, after their stent. And the endpoint is heart attack, death, stroke, or a clot inside the stent. And it's pretty clear that if you get placebo, you're not going to have 100% incidence of instant thrombosis, but your incidence is higher than with Plavix. If you get Plavix, it's not zero, but it's lower than with placebo. And so if you don't know anything at all about your patient, you would give them 75 milligrams of clopidogrel or Plavix every day. Uh, and that's standard of care. Now, that was 2005. Plavix came on the market in the United States in 1997, but it was in 2006, so after this came out, that it became clear that there's a single common SNP in a gene called CYP2C19 that impairs clopidogrel's bioactivation. What that means is clopidogrel, the pill, has a chemical in it that is not active. You have to take it, you have to have it absorbed, and it has to get to your liver, and the liver then metabolizes it into something that turns out to inhibit clots. And uh, it's important for me to say that this, the, the fact that there's variability in the activity of this gene was actually discovered by Grant Wilkinson, who was a distinguished senior member of the Division of Clinical Pharmacology here in the mid-1980s is when he made that discovery. So there's a role, a huge role, for basic science in driving forward this agenda of personalized medicine, and Grant and his discovery epitomizes that. Uh, the other place where, where genetics is turning into a huge uh, uh, game changer is in cancer. So this is the genomes that I've shown you before, the chromosomes, only this is not quite normal. Because if you look carefully <coughs> at this female, <laughs> you look carefully, the bottom end of chromosome 22 is missing. And the bottom end of chromosome 9 is longer than it should be. So this tiny little smidgen is called a Philadelphia chromosome. And it's been around since the 60s. And people know that this is the, the, the chromosomal signature of a disease called chronic myelogenous leukemia, a form of leukemia. And we know now what the mechanism is for this, this, uh, this so-called Philadelphia chromosome. A piece of the bottom end of chromosome 9 glues itself onto the bottom of chromosome 22, while the long piece of chromosome 22 glues itself onto chromosome 9. So they switch places. 
and they create a new gene, and the new gene is called BCR ABLE, and that gene is active. And when that gene is active, it turns on the leukemia process. So people, when they realize that, develop drugs to inhibit the activity of the protein encoded by that gene, and that medicine is called Gleevec, and it's been a real game changer for chronic myelogenous leukemia. Not perfect, it's never perfect, but it really is something very, very new. The other way in which genomics is changing the game in cancer and in other places is it's changing our way of thinking about diagnosis. So <clears throat> this is four forms of malignant melanoma, a particularly severe form of skin cancer. And in 1980, you would ask a skin doctor, how, is, how do I classify melanoma? And they would tell you, well, it depends on whether it arises in damaged skin or not, or whether it arises in the armpit or on the skin or in the eye. That's how they classified it. And based on that classification, they would pr propose different treatments. So uh, let me make a digression. I've made lots of digressions, but here's a digression. This man is Gordon Moore, the founder of Intel. Everybody, you know, who has a cell phone now, everybody who has a little computer owes Gordon uh, Moore a huge uh, debt of gratitude. So Gordon Moore's law says the computational power in your PC doubles every 18 months. Uh, or another way of saying it is that the cost drops by a factor of two every 10 to 18 months. So that's Moore's law applied to uh, computer power. Moore's law has also been applied to genome sequencing. So the first genome was sequenced in about 2000, 2001, and people argue about the price, but it was around $100 million, and this is what Moore's law says the price of genome sequencing should drop by. And uh, for a while, it followed Moore's law. It was dropping. So by 2006, you could get your whole genome done for $10 million, but something happened in 2006, new technology, and it's plummeted. And now you can get a whole genome for under $10,000, if you talk to the right people, $3,000. What to do with the information <laughs> is, is, is a little bit complicated because there's a lot of information there that we don't understand. But in, it's, this kind of technology has been applied to cancer. And when you apply it to cancer, you can find mutations in a gene called BRAF in, in melanoma in 50% of this form, in 10% of this form, 5% of this form, 15% of this form, and mutations in other genes. So these are, ge these are mutations in the cancer cells, not in, not in the human, not in your cells that you're born with, but in the cancer cells. And it turns out that those mutations also drive the cancer process. So this is a PET scan of a patient who has a melanoma. Each dot represents a metastatic lesion. This patient is very sick. This patient is going to die within weeks. They have BRAF, and they have a particular mutation in BRAF, which we call V600E. And after 15 days of a pill, not something that makes your hair fall out or not something that makes you throw up, but just a plain old pill, the disease is almost gone. This is bladder and brain and normal. So that's a huge, huge change in the way people take care of melanoma. I point out to you that these scans were done at Vanderbilt. The drug is, uh, has an unpronounceable name as far as I'm concerned, so it's PLX4032. And, and it's now a marketed drug and uh, widely used in this particular form of melanoma. So if you have melanoma, you get your melanoma genotyped. And if you have this, you get the drug. If you don't have it, the drug won't work. So there's no point in giving it. And at Vanderbilt, we do that kind of genotyping routinely. And we display the data in the electronic medical record. So this is a person who's had their melanoma looked at at many, many, many different genetic places. And um, they have V600E. And so they're a candidate for that drug. So um, let me tell you a little bit about some of the other programs that we have here. Uh, so if you have a patient who's going to the cath lab and going to get clopidogrel or going to get Plavix, um, uh, you might want to get a genotype. So you can order that genotype, and the pathology department will do it for you for a couple of hundred dollars. Um, the other way is to have your genome done already have genetic information available to you already. So this is a patient who, this is a cartoon that was done in, you know, when the human genome came out, or the first human genome. And this patient has her sequence on paper. That's not the way it's going to work. <laughs> and she hands it to the pharmacist, and the pharmacist is supposed to do something with it, and that's not the way it's going to work either. But we call this reactive genotyping. We call this preemptive genotyping. So that's another way of saying, uh, if you had the genetic information, would you act on it? or do you need to get the genetic information? So uh, how is that going to happen? We think that this is, we're, at the, we're able to genotype. We have a big knowledge base now. How is this going to start to happen? 
Well, we think it's only going to, I think it's only going to happen at a place that has the following attributes. It has excellent basic science and a very, very strong commitment to information technology and electronic medical record keeping, because you can't keep track of all those, rec all those variants that I've told you about without a computer. And what that institution needs to do is then use the healthcare system as a discovery tool, and when they discover something that is important, they then adapt whatever it is they discover to make healthcare better and also to inform the basic sciences. And that institution right now around the world is Vanderbilt. Uh, there are very, very few other places that have gotten anywhere with doing this. Uh, and the programs that I'm going to tell you about in the next eight minutes, 10 minutes, five minutes, uh, reflect a, a real leadership position in those areas. So I told you about Mayo Clinic's plans for a database. Uh, this is our DNA bank. Our DNA bank passed 150,000 samples last week. Uh, it's the largest DNA bank in the world married to electronic medical records. There are a couple that are larger that don't have electronic health records. So the idea here is this is the tool for discovery. This is what we're using for discovering. And I'll show you a couple of examples. These are three Manhattan plots from data that we've generated using the electronic medical record and uh, the DNA samples in BioView. That's the DNA bank. And each one of them has a signal, and each one of them is a drug response uh, problem. Uh, we're working on whether these signals are real, and we're working on figuring out ways of convincing ourselves that they're important enough to put in the electronic record. But that's a tool for discovery. I've also talked to you about this genome-wide association study. Because of the electronic record, we're able to turn this on its head. This experiment, remember, is everybody is told whether they have atrial fibrillation or not atrial fibrillation. And then we do a million genetic tests. Well, suppose we took 15 or 20,000 people and we said, here's a particular genetic variant. Some people are wild type and some people have a variant. And let's ask whether that variation associates with any particular diagnosis in the electronic record. So turn the experiment on its head. We call that phenome-wide association. And this is what it looks like. Um, and so this is one particular SNP that we're interested in. It has to do with skin color, and all of these signals have to do with skin cancer and skin diseases. So going from a genetic variant that is found to be important for skin color to a genetic variant that does other things to human physiology becomes very important in terms of drug development, in terms of predicting who's going to get skin cancer, in terms of all the things you want to do. So it's a new tool. And it's only in a large electronic medical record system that that's possible. This is, we're part of a network of, of sites that do this kind of work. And I just put this up to show you that we're uh, greater by easily 50% or 100% than, than any of the other sites that are in this network. So uh, we really are the 900 pound gorilla in the corner, which is, is something nice to be. So um, you're a cardiologist and you're taking care of a patient who's going to get Plavix. And uh, you debate with yourself whether you're going to uh, get a genetic test or not. But the problem is that for the Plavix story, for every Plavix story, there are uh, a couple of more stories around other drugs. And I've just shown some of the drugs here. Each one of them has a genetic story. I'm not going to tell you the story because I don't have time. But some of these may be familiar to some of you as consumers. Some of them may be familiar to you as prescribers. So each one of them has a genetic story. So our idea is to ask the question, well, if we take 50,000 patients who are followed at Vanderbilt, how many of those patients get a drug that has a genetic story? And when I say genetic story, I mean something about genetics in the label that is FDA approved. And we did that experiment uh, looking in our electronic medical record. And the answer was sort of a surprise. 65% of patients received one drug that has a genetic story over the course of five years, and 15% received four drugs that had a genetic story. So we have started a project called PREDICT. And PREDICT is our way, our framework, for introducing genetic information into the electronic record. So our idea is to select people who are at risk for getting a drug that has a genetic story, Genotype not for that drug, but for many, many drugs, for many variants that are relevant to many, many drugs, and then store all that information in our electronic medical record, use it when it's needed, track what happens. So those are all 
Those are all very, very difficult things to do, but I'm delighted to tell you that we've been doing it for two years. We've now done it in 9,000 patients, and these are the data for, 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 for clopidogrel, Clavix. The green are people who have the normal genotype, the red are people who have the high-risk genotype, and the pinks are people who have some risky genotypes. So we have 2.7% of our population has, who would get Plavix would, would be predicted not to respond, and altogether about 22% of them have something that would predict, make them uh, less likely to respond perfectly. And we've also done it with simvastatin, and it's the same kind of numbers. 2% have the really high risk variant that I showed you earlier, and altogether there's about 26% who are at risk. And we're busy looking at other drugs, we're busy asking the question, how many people fall into both categories? How many people have at least one variant? And we think at the end of the day, after you've done 10 variants, everybody's gonna have something. And that's the trick. So um, we had the little lady with her, with her piece of paper in the electronic medical record at Vanderbilt, this is what it looks like when you call up a patient. Uh, there's a list of drug uh, sensitivities, list of medications, list of diagnoses, and uh, right now there's a place called Drug Genome Interactions, which lists these genotypes. Um, if a patient has that genotype in their record, has an, a, a variant genotype, and clopidogrel is prescribed, something pops up in the electronic medical record that says, be careful. Uh, we call that point of care decision support. It gives advice to physicians, and it says genetic testing has been performed, indicates this patient is at risk for an inadequate platelet response to clopidogrel. Think of doing something else. And I like this picture because uh, it comes back to the idea of taking care of a patient in the personalized medicine space as opposed to a disease. This patient, uh, who was written up in the reporters, so this is public knowledge, was the first patient we had in our experience who had a STAR2, STAR2 genotype. And she was prescribed clopidogrel after this cardiologist, John McPherson, put a stent in her. So we think John takes care of this particular patient, not as a stent, but as a patient, as a person. And he knows a lot about her, and now he knows a little bit more about her, and we hope that that will improve the care. And also, so I'll close with a quote from Sir William Osler again. Variability is the law of life. No two faces are the same, no two bodies are alike, no two individuals react alike and behave alike under the abnormal conditions that we know of as disease, and I would add as uh, drug exposure. So again, in order to execute on this kind of vision of moving genetic information into the flow of healthcare, you have to have a system that allows us to harness the healthcare system, allows us to harness the best of information science and the best of basic science in pharmacology, clinical pharmacology, uh, genomics and many, many other disciplines. I told you earlier it's a team sport. It's late in the day. These are the teams. I'm not going to go through everybody. If there's somebody on this, somebody who, who looks at this slide and, and their picture is missing and they feel like they should be on it, please tell me. <laughs> the chancellors, I debated about the chancellor. I could put the whole board of trust because, because the board of trust has heard about this and the chancellor has heard about this and they, they have to support this in the end because this is something that makes us different. Uh, but I did... Uh, you know, in lieu of the chancellor, I did put uh, this guy down here uh, in the corner. Uh, I also emphasize that only people who are currently at Vanderbilt can get on this slide. Uh, there are a number of people who have been very important for our efforts but who are not, uh, not at the institution anymore, so I decided to keep, keep this to, to current people. And I, I thank uh, the chancellor again for uh, the opportunity or the nerve-wracking experience of delivering this talk to, uh, to my home audience, and I hope I've edified. Thank you very much. I need to uh, uh, the, one, the, the one thing I have no control over is the air conditioning, which is, it appears to be not working. Yeah, or off or something. But, uh, we have time for questions. So questions? No, qu no questions. I'm leaving now. <laughs> Jeff asked a question. Yeah, oh, yeah, okay. How much do you test for people who are taking drugs and it doesn't work and it's a waste of money? Uh, well, you know, I would love to say we do that all the time. Uh, we're, 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 we're starting that now. Um, 
So you could look at Plavix and you could say, if you're a, a, a star two, star two, it, it, it's, it is a waste of money and you shouldn't be taking it because, because it's just not gonna work. Um, we, don't, we don't think of it that way because we think of it, it's, the question is are you trying to avoid people in whom the drug isn't gonna work or are you trying to avoid side effects? I'm fond of saying that the commonest side effect of drugs that we use right now is that they don't work the way we sh think they should. So that's a side effect. So it's a little bit of a conflated question. I hate to give that kind of roundabout answer to a lawyer, but, um, <laughs> but w I think all the testing that we do, some of the testing we do really is directed and would be directed at finding people who are at risk for serious side effects. I mean, that's one of the things we would really like to do. We're, that's in its infancy right now. Uh, so the myopathy question with simvastatin, that's sort of the aim there. Uh, the clopidogrel is sort of bound up in efficacy as well as side effects. So we, we, what we really want are signals that are big. So we want to find common genetic variants that have a big impact. And, and that's one of the controversies in the field. How big an impact do you want? How common a variant do you need to have? How good does the evidence have to be before you start to stick this in the electronic record or not? And people spend a lot of time arguing because because people are used to the reactive way of thinking. So, so up until very, very recently, the idea that this would be embedded in the, in the record and just accessible was, was, a, was a fairy tale. It's only at Vanderbilt and one other institution in the United States. And strangely, that institution is also in Tennessee, and that's St. Jude Children's Hospital. So St. Jude has the virtue that every time somebody walks into that hospital, they have drug-resistant leukemia. That's the disease they treat. And so the, the physicians at St. Jude can look at that patient and say, oh, over the course of the next year, this patient's gonna get this drug, this drug, this drug, this drug, this drug, we're gonna test them for all those drugs. Now the fact is that they're never gonna have 150,000 patients. They're never, I mean, their volume is small, but they're doing it. And they're, interestingly, it is in Tennessee. So uh, what we want are drugs that have big signals and genetic variants that have big signals. This business of whole genome sequencing is opening up our eyes to the fact that there's lots and lots of rarer variants that, whose significance we're gonna to have to struggle with figuring out, but, but they're there and they clearly modulate drug responses in some people. So right now, the, the, the whole field is in its infancy, but we're gonna to get to the point where we're gonna be able to use whole genomes eventually. Yes. So um, one of the reasons I know about the St. Jude program is because uh, we're part of a network called the Pharmacogenomics Research Network and we work together in that network to, to share scientific information. Uh, and, and sharing scientific information is tough, but it's nothing compared to sharing genetic information. So I'll give you an example of a scenario that when we started this whole saga, I, I wouldn't have even thought was something worth worrying about, but now it's something we worry about all the time. Um, somebody comes to Vanderbilt. We have data on their CYP2C19 status, and then they move to Helena, Montana, and they have a heart attack, and they get clopidogrel. Who, who carries that information with them? Does it the patient who carries the information? We think at the end of the day that the only way to transmit that is going to be either the patient gets their records and the doctor gets them, or, uh, or the patient carries the records with them. So one of the ways in which we have to solve that particular problem is we have a portal called My Health at Vanderbilt. Many of you may be subscribers to that. And in My Health at Vanderbilt, if you've had genetic testing, the results are available to you to look at, and, and actually there's a little explanation of what this CYP2C19 variant looks like. Um, but it's a big problem, and it's a big problem for everybody who's thinking about how to use genetic information. Every time you do a genetic test, you'd love the patient to know about the result, and you'd love the, that to be embedded somehow in a, in a record so it doesn't get done again, because the fact is that the genes you're born with are the genes you die with in your own body. There's the cancer part and other things, but, but leaving that aside, you only want that to be done once, accurately, and, uh, and so ways in which to port genetic information across healthcare systems is something that we're thinking about along with a lot of other people around the country, but we're at the table with all the, for all those discussions because you can't have that kind of discussion without having Vanderbilt at the table because of what we do here. George. Do you think nationally there has been, for the late individual, a proper balance 
Pro probably not. I mean, I, I, I hope I've given you the sense that there are a couple of genetic variants that are important, we think, for drug response, important enough to put in the record, but there are really only two right now. We, when we do the genetic testing for part of PREDICT, we actually test for 184 variants. And those are stuck in a database, but we don't think we know enough about those variants to even pull them out and stick them in the electronic record. So we're being very deliberate about this. And so I hope I've transmitted the, the, that idea to you. And obviously, that doesn't, come, that doesn't play well in Time or Newsweek. I mean, they'd prefer it to be much more expansive than that. The cancer world, um, uh, you know, I'm a really interested observer of that. Uh, and I think that they're onto something really, really important. And again, one of the places that's leading the world is, is William Powell and his personal cancer genome project here because one of the big questions is as tumors get sequenced, people find new stuff. And they say, gee whiz, has anyone seen not BRAF V600E, but BRAF V597I? Has anybody seen that before? And there's a website that doctors and patients can go to and say, Here's my genotype. Has anyone seen that before? That's called mycancergenome.org, and it's run from Vanderbilt. So uh, I think it's only, only by accruing very, very, very large data sets that we're going to be able to start to make head or tail of what some of these variants mean. But yes, yes. Is there anybody who has been taking blood for five years? Is Uh -huh. uh, so, so those kinds of questions I, I, I'd love to w wax eloquent about, but I think you have to talk to your doctor. I, re I, I decline to give it. <laughs> so if you were taking Plavix for five years and didn't have some catastrophic event, uh, then, then, then you're probably going to be one of the people who doesn't have a genetic variant and you're going to respond just fine. Most times when we prescribe Plavix, we prescribe it for a month based on that study, three months, six months, or a year occasionally two years, but Plavix is not usually open-ended. Keith Churchwell will, could, will correct me if I'm wrong, but we, we, we don't usually prescribe Plavix in an open-ended kind of way, so we always stop it at some point once the patient's been doing well. Five years is a long time. So you're... Well, uh, the answer to that is probably no. You're welcome. Keith? So, Dan, it's a great talk. So, there's the, there's on one end, the patients who actually, Plavix being a very good example, who are, uh, who have no difficulty in terms of taking us with the catalog as well. On the other end, uh, the catalog is quite poorly, it's very important. Then there's the money middle. Yep. Those who are intermediate, intermediate metabolizers. Is there, as we go forward, is there going to be more information that we're going to be able to accrue that actually has a greater insight of what we do with that? So, so uh, the, the problem is that genetics don't tell you yes or no. Genetics tell you, well, this patient's more likely to have this, and that patient's more likely to have that. And when the likelihood is very strong that they're not going to respond, we're comfortable acting on that. And when the likelihood is very strong that they're going to respond just fine, we're comfortable acting with that. And then there's this group of people in the middle that we don't know what to do with. So Plavix is an example, and it's an important example to dwell on because it, it's a, it, it, despite the fact it's generic, it still sells billions of dollars a year. Um, uh, that's a sort of drug-specific question. I think it'll, for that, I think it'll end up being platelet function testing. And, and, and I think that the genetics will tell you whether to start with Plavix or not, and then after that, adjust the dose by platelet function, something like that. And that's going to be generic across all those drugs that, that uh, cardiologists, I'm a cardiologist, you know, love and hate. Uh, we, we love them because they, they help people not get instant thrombosis, and we hate them because they bleed like stink. Yes? Um, so the, um, the PREDICT program uh, does genetic testing on patients who we think, based on elaborate or not so elaborate informatics algorithms, are at risk for getting one of those 58 drugs um, in the next five years. Actually, in the next three years is the way the, way the algorithms work. Um, and so if you go to your doctor and say, I want to get PREDICT testing, they can do that. They can order that as a test. Uh, and then have that embedded. One thought is that, um, you know, sometimes the, the, the systems tell me who should be tested. The, the, when I go to clinic, the system pops up and says, predict test, 
think about ordering it. So sometimes what happens is it's a patient who I see once a year, but all their other care is at St. Thomas. I have nothing against St. Thomas, but um, I don't have a way of delivering that information to that patient. So it's pointless to, for that patient right now to get predict testing at Vanderbilt because they just with the follow-up just isn't in place. Sometimes it's a 90-year-old person with terminal heart failure and we're doing comfort care and, and the system isn't smart enough to know that, but I'm smart enough to know that we don't need to fiddle, fiddle with genetics then. So, so sometimes the systems are imperfect and I, I sometimes think that we're going to get to a vision at some point where the test will be done as a routine um, and it won't be your whole genome, it'll be just selected pieces that are important for drug response when you're 21. I picked that now because you can go out and then have a drink afterwards if you don't like the results. <laughs> and, 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 and you'll have counseling, and it'll, the counseling will be about drug responses and drugs you should avoid, and it may also be about certain diseases that you might be at very high risk for. But we have to be very careful because all of this is shades of gray. It's not black and white. Okay. Uh, uh, one more question. Okay. <laughs> I would like to hear your thoughts about the fact that And cost, yeah. Um, there, there are two scenarios. There are two extreme scenarios, and then every scenario in the middle. The two extreme scenario. One extreme scenario is every time somebody gets a genetic test, it just opens up a can of worms, and they get a whole bunch of other medical tests, X-rays, what have you, and then some of those tests are false positives, so they open up more tests, and then and then we're sort of in this downward spiral. Uh, based on some genetic test that turns out maybe to have been incorrect in the first place. So that's one scenario, and we want to avoid that one. On the other hand, the, 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 the delightful scenario is that we can actually pick, you know, you're an oncologist, boy, I would love to be able to pick drugs that work and that don't make people sick. So I want to avoid giving somebody a drug that's not going to work for them. And maybe the right genome to ask that question to is not my genome, but my cancer's genome. Uh, and, uh, and if you're an oncologist, you know more about that than I do, or you... I hope you know more about that than I do. Um, but, but I think that, that the, the, the hope is that by doing this kind of multiplexed pharmacogenetic testing for drugs like Plavix, Invastatin, uh, Tamoxifen, what have you, we'll be able to select patients in whom those drugs are not going to work, figure out alternate therapies, and uh, avoid uh, some serious side effects along the way. So there's, there's this hope that we'll save costs, and one of the things, one of the goals of the PREDICT project in, in the long term, and we may be getting to the long term now, is start to think about, uh, start to look at the question of, of outcomes. What are we doing in terms of outcomes? Are we changing, are we sort of, you know, bending that cost curve that everybody talks about? Thank you very much. A little long, but I can't. No, no.